Diamonds are known for their high price, glamour and rarity. But that is the case on Earth. Elsewhere, they fall from the sky. According to Dominic Krauss, a physicist at the Helmholtz Center in Dresden, temperatures are high enough on planets such as Uranus and Neptune to split those hydrocarbons into hydrogen and carbon. The pressures are sufficient to transform the carbon into diamonds. As a result, beneath the top layer of the atmosphere, diamonds fall like rain. In fact, our galactic space has plenty of diamonds. However, natural diamonds, which came into existence a billion years ago, are now losing their allure. The reason is the rise in the purchase of man-made diamonds, synthetic diamonds. Coming up next, you will watch the step-by-step -step process of manufacturing natural diamonds. How are they mined from the earth and crafted into their most perfect form? Next, we will compare those natural diamonds with lab-grown diamonds and show you how they are grown in the lab. What are the differences and also, which one of them will take over the market? If you are interested in such interesting topics, you can subscribe to our channel. Now, let's begin with natural diamonds. Diamonds exist in 12 basic hues or shades, but all of these are made up of carbon. When the pressure underneath the Earth reaches roughly 50,000 times that of the Earth's surface and the temperature rises up to 1600 centigrade, carbon atoms link with four other atoms to form diamonds. But generally, the formation process of diamonds occurs from 150 to 750 kilometer deep in the Earth. Luckily, a volcanic eruption brings this precious gemstone out in the form of magma. There are two main types of magma that carry natural diamonds to the surface, kimberlite and lamprawat. Before the discovery and study of kimberlite, diamonds were only mined from secondary alluvial sources. The alluvial sources are river environments where diamonds have been eroded from their initial source. Today, it is called secondary diamond mining, which is still practiced in various areas of Sierra Leone, Brazil, Angola, Namibia, and even on the seafloor where rivers flow into the oceans. There, the workers are manually pouring the alluvial material into handmade sieves. The sand grains flow through the mesh with water, leaving only stones behind. Then, they try to find out if there is any diamond on the sieve. But despite having plenty of valuable gems, Sierra Leone is under a resource curse. Smuggling of diamonds, corrupt elites and rebellion forces never let this country prosper from the wealth it has. You can watch Leonardo DiCaprio's famous movie, Blood Diamond, on this topic. But we will take you to another extreme point where the conditions remain severe for a completely different reason. It is the Diavik Diamond Mine, located in Canada. There, the temperature falls below minus 40 Celsius. In these freezing conditions, the miners with their heavy-duty machines work day and night to produce tons of diamonds. Surface mining always starts with blasts that break up layers of soil and rock. To see how much blasting material is used, let's jump to Botswana, a diamond-rich country in southern Africa. There, preparations are being made to blast. After successful blasts, wheel loaders, dump trucks and other mining machines team up to remove the blasted layer. It needs to be done to build roads to access the kimberlite below 100 miles. From above, the open pit looks like a spiral pattern going deep into the center. Building these roads is a challenge in itself. The slope of the road affects the efficiency of the dumpers. Rocks on these roads directly impact tire life. Water coming down from the slope can be catastrophic for miners. Therefore, it is continuously monitored, managed and pumped from the bottom. Special products are sprayed to densify the roads. Layer after layer, the miners reach the bottom center, where kimberlite exists like a carrot barren into the earth. It is extracted using hydraulic shovels and the extracted ore is dumped into the primary crusher located at the top of the hill.
When the dumper transports the kimberlite, nobody can tell whether there is just some boulder or approximately 700 carats of diamond in it. Since 2003, this Canadian mine has been producing 7,000 metric tons of kimberlite every day. But in recent years, production has decreased from 8 million to 3.34 million carats per year. But who says diamonds only exist on land? The seafloor near the western coast of Namibia has plenty of gems and jewels, producing a whopping 80 million carats of diamonds every year. This amount is 10 times more than what the Denvik diamond mine was extracting at its peak. Let's take a look at the ship, which harvests the precious jewels of the oceans. Diamond mining from undersea is a complicated process. First, the seabed is scanned and analyzed by sending experts down in small submarines and taking samples. After identification of the diamond reservoir, they start mapping the diamond mine to plan its mining. Next, a 300-ton machine is deployed into the water. They call it the Butcher. It trawls the ocean bed in search of diamonds. Then, the sediments are sucked up to the ship from the ocean floor using long pipes. On board, sediments are cleaned and sorted into smaller stones using a series of vibrating racks, followed by revolving drums that smash rocks. Material that does not contain diamond-bearing material is returned to the ocean and the natural ecosystem is carefully monitored. In contrast to land-based mines, rehabilitation of marine mining settings occurs organically in a short time. The diamonds go through an automated procedure before being sealed into a succession of small, barcoded containers so no human hands touch them. The containers are then put into cases and transported three times per week by helicopter to onshore vaults. Likewise, the harvested kimberlite from the land is processed through crusher drums. Because diamonds are harder than the host rock around them, they can sustain the impact of a crusher. On the other hand, the host rock gets crushed. Water is added to the crushed ore to make a slurry. This helps the separation of diamonds. Due to their higher density, the diamonds sink into the water, whereas lighter material floats on the surface. However, there is still an unwanted hard rock with diamonds. To remove it, the diamond sorting machines are used. Here is Thomas Com XRT300 in action. It guarantees 99% diamond recovery. These sorting machines feature cutting-edge X-ray technology. Upon hitting the X-ray, the diamond illuminates and emits light. The sorting machine detects the diamonds and ejects them using a pneumatic device, whereas the left stone drops on a separate belt. Diamonds are now in the hands of professionals. They analyze them manually and sort them according to their size and color. With over 12,000 different kinds of diamonds, determining their worth requires a skilled eye and many years of knowledge. This is the Queen of Kalahari, a 342-carat diamond that was found at Lukara's Karowe mine in Botswana. The famous jewelry company, Chopard, purchased the stone to make a diamond necklace. The co-president of Chopard, Caroline Schoeffler, took an interest in this stone. Cutting diamonds is the most important part of diamond processing. It is not just about breaking a diamond into desired pieces or polishing it, but also the process of diamond cutting involves giving a diamond its best shape so it can sparkle maximally. First of all, the diamond is carefully analyzed and marked to indicate where cuts need to be made. Next, it is cleaved by carefully striking along the natural grain of the diamond. But this was an old practice. Nowadays, laser technology offers accurate cutting of diamonds. When a laser beam hits a diamond, a chemical process starts in the impacted area. This rearranges carbon atoms and converts the laser-fired part of the diamond into graphite, the same material that we have in pencils. The first piece of the Queen of Kalahari has been successfully cut, but it requires serious polishing to glitter. 
This is a tough, time-consuming job that requires meticulous handling of diamonds. Because of its high heat conductivity, a diamond cannot last on the wheel. Every edge of a diamond is dealt with great care to optimize its interaction with light. The highly skilled artisans who transform rough diamonds into glittering gemstones are called diamantaires. On parle de quelque chose de beau. Alors la machine, elle peut vous faire des angles, elle peut vous faire des proportions, mais elle peut pas au final euh, décider si la pierre est belle ou pas. First of all, the widest part of a diamond is shaped. It is called girdle, and the process is called girdling. These flat parts are called facets. Faceting is done by precisely defining the flat geometric pattern of a diamond. Lastly, polishing begins with placing the stone in a lead dop or mechanical clamp and holding it down on a spinning cast iron lap laden with diamond dust. But diamonds were not always polished. In the past, people used to wear diamonds in their rough form. Koh i Noor is its best example. It was 793 carats when the Mughal emperor possessed it. Later, it was cut, polished, and reduced to 186 carats by the emperor's jewelry. In 1852, Costa Diamonds further reduced it to its current 105.6 carat oval brilliant cut. As you saw, it takes a lot to extract a diamond from its ore and make it a perfect piece of jewelry. There is another way to produce diamonds, and it does not require millions of years, but only a few weeks. It is important to mention two widely adopted techniques that lead to the formation of diamonds in labs. The first one is known as the high pressure, high temperature, or HPHT. This process was developed in the 1950s to copy the natural diamond formation process in labs. A tiny carbon material, known as a diamond seed, is subjected to extremely high pressure, around 1.5 million pounds per square inch, and a temperature of over 1500 centigrade. This is done in a specially designed chamber. The tremendous heat and pressure force pure carbon around the seed to melt and crystallize. As a result, the seed gradually starts enlarging over several weeks. A modern method of growing synthetic diamonds is known as chemical vapor deposition or CVD. It is quite popular these days. A tiny layer is sliced from the natural diamond to create the CVD diamond seed, which is a type 2 seed and contains 100% carbon. The seed is polished and prepared to the desired thickness before being inserted in the CVD plasma reactor. Rather than directly heating the diamond seed, hydrocarbon gas is superheated via microwaves. This results in the formation of plasma, which rains down on the seed and grows it layer by layer. Impurities such as nitrogen and boron may also enter the diamond formation process along with gases. CVD is a controlled procedure that prevents contaminants from entering diamond carbon particles, which gradually disintegrate and create layers on top of the diamond seed. The technique yields a rough CVD diamond with the same physical, chemical and visual qualities as natural diamonds. The diamonds are then precisely removed before cutting. Two newly grown diamonds, one made through the HPHT method and the other via CVD, look completely different in their raw form. However, they possess identical properties, just like natural diamonds. After polishing, it is impossible to distinguish between them. But there are some technical differences. HPHT diamonds have higher color grades compared to those grown through CVD. Most diamonds that are less than one carat in size are grown using HPHT because it is a more cost-effective method. CVD diamonds generally show higher optical transmittance up to 71% with only approximately 6% drop at temperatures as high as 873 Kelvin. 
HPHT diamonds have higher nitrogen impurity levels, approximately 270 parts per million, compared to CVD diamonds, approximately 0.89 parts per million, which significantly affects their infrared transmittance. Likewise, there are some differences between natural and synthetic diamonds. Natural diamonds are often significantly bigger on average than synthetic diamonds manufactured in laboratories. The Cullinan diamond was the largest natural diamond ever unearthed, weighing 3,106 carats, more than 1.3 pounds, in rough. In contrast, the biggest synthetic diamond is a 50.25 carat CVD laboratory-grown diamond named Shipra. It took eight months to grow this diamond. Furthermore, synthetic diamonds frequently contain minuscule metallic inclusions from the growing process that are attracted to a powerful portable magnet, whereas natural diamonds are non-magnetic. While synthetic diamonds are chemically and physically identical to genuine diamonds, they frequently lack the natural inclusions, fractures, and other distinctive features that gemologists use to identify natural diamonds under a microscope. But despite these differences, the demand for lab-grown diamonds is increasing rapidly. According to some reports, the global market size of synthetic diamonds was valued at $13.02 billion in 2023. It will reach $21.77 billion by 2030. The reason is that synthetic diamonds are more affordable. Generally, a synthetic diamond costs half to two-thirds less money. With advancements in technology, the production price will further decrease. This is a serious challenge to natural gemstones because their allure will fade away if the masses start owing diamonds. But synthetic diamonds are still far away from taking over the market. In 2022, the global diamond value was $86.5 billion. Comparatively, the synthetic diamond industry is much smaller. The recent decline in the purchase of mined diamonds has multiple reasons. One of them is sanctions on Russia, which produces a chunk of the world's natural diamonds. Moreover, even if synthetic diamonds dominate the market, they won't be able to offer the large diamonds that Mother Nature has formed over thousands of years. Let's not forget that a diamond at the end is a luxury product. Branding matters a lot in this business and those who keep its rarity in one way or another will never run out of profit. Which type of diamond would you prefer to buy? Let us know in the comment section. Hopefully, you enjoyed this video. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time.